Alright, Dying Light 2 is right around the corner, and I thought I would use this opportunity to prep you on the monsters you're going to be facing in the game. We're going to go over everything that we've learned about every single zombie type, and I'm going to showcase as much footage and gameplay of those zombie types as possible. Now, do keep in mind that you need to be just as careful around humans as you do zombies, and every single human is infected. Now, exposure to UV light does temporarily reverse the infection, just for a limited time, and this includes for the player as well. You need to hit that sunlight or eat some UV shrooms. There will be a timer, especially at nighttime, where if you are in the darkness for so long, you will turn, and you can actually upgrade this stat so you have more resistance to the virus as well. But if the UV rays don't slow the spread of the pathogen in time, an infected individual enters the first stage of the disease and becomes a viral. Virals are still full of vigor, which the virus enhances further. They are constantly uneasy and racked by spasms, and once they find a prey, Every muscle in their body instinctively engages in a mad pursuit. They'll chase it relentlessly, and as soon as they catch it, they'll chaotically beat it, scratch it, and bite it like wild animals. The viral's posture, their tense muscles and tendons, emphasizes the aggression boiling beneath the surface. So there are a couple noticeable ways in which the viral has changed from the first game. The biggest one is their sensitivity to UV light. They're not just going to be running around in the daytime anymore. You're only going to find these guys at nighttime or in dark areas. But they're still quite sensitive to sound. They're still going to swarm you in packs. And overall, they're just a good staple zombie type to have. Now, if virals do stay out in the sun for too long, they will decay and turn into biters. Driven by the lowest animal instincts, biters shamble across the street, half-conscious in search of prey. Sunlight, which is lethal to the virus, dries out their skin to the bone. They're not much of a threat alone, but if you get surrounded, they'll swarm you and eat you alive like rats. The parallel is intentional. Just as rats are blamed for causing the Black Death in the 14th century, biters are a physical manifestation of the plague you face in Dying Light 2 Stay Human. They feature different levels of decomposition depending on how long they've been out in the sunlight. Some are relatively fresh, while others have become skeletons with dried skin stretched over their rag-clad frames. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I don't know about you guys, but I really like that part about them featuring different levels of decomposition to give some visual variants of the walkers, and each kind of walker has its own story attached to it, and you can tell just from looking at it how long it's been rotting in the sun for. Now, I don't believe we've seen any examples where this variance affects gameplay, but there was some variance with the Dying Light 1 biters, such as the policemen who could not be dropkicked, they just would not fall down, and also the hazmat biters, which are back. At least they do seem like biters. We haven't seen any hazmat zombies sprinting at us, so it looks like hazmats are back and they are still walkers. They're still nice and slow, and you can still use that gas tank on their backs to wipe out the rest of the zombies. So that's what happens when a viral decays in the sun, they turn into a biter. But what about if they retreat to the shadows and they stay away from UV light? Well, when a viral manages to avoid UV radiation for some time, they evolve into the deadliest of infected, a volatile primal strength that crushes any hope for a fair fight. His skin has hardened into armor over the years. The yawning hole in his torso clenches like a jaw, giving you no opportunity to deal the lethal blow. It's the species that will rule the earth, unless somebody exterminates it. Now, not too long ago, I did make a video on the evolution of the Volatile. Gameplay-wise, story-wise, concept, art, and design-wise, we explored the different types that you fight in the first game, and how the Volatiles in Dying Light 2 are going to compare, and we also explored the potential of a sentient Volatile faction becoming, well, the species that will rule the Earth. I'm quite proud of how the video turned out. Uh, in my humble opinion, it's one of the best videos I've made in a long time, so I'm going to leave a link to that. But if you're just coming from the first game and you're wondering, what are we going to be facing in Dying Light 2? What can we expect when fighting the Volatiles in Dying Light 2? Well, 
They are more armored, they are more resistant to damage, they are tougher. Overall, they are stronger because they've been evolving, but you're going to encounter them less often, and here's why. Dying Light 2 features a revamped pursuit system. It was in the first game, but it just wasn't very noticeable, and it's a big part of nighttime gameplay in Dying Light 2. There are four different levels of pursuit, and when you're just running around in nighttime gameplay, you are only going to encounter volatiles if you hit pursuit level 4, which has proved to be kind of difficult to rack up that pursuit level and especially survive until then. If you do manage to hit pursuit level 4, intentionally or unintentionally, you will be seeing volatiles, and once again, they are tougher than the first game. They are very difficult to deal with, and not only that, you're still getting chased by banshees and virals, so just keep that in mind. If you don't want to see these guys, stay away from pursuit level 4, although there are still some areas in the game, some dark zones, and I'm sure there will be some key story moments as well where you are going to run into these guys. It's just going to happen less often than the first game. Now this is where it gets really interesting. When volatiles are exposed to certain chemicals that mutate their DNA, this is when we get special types of infected, and there are so many more types in the second game than there were in the first game. If you've played the first game, you'll already be quite familiar with the Demolisher, the Bolter, the Bomber, and the Goon. Not too much has changed gameplay-wise with these zombie types, it's mainly just their appearance that has had a bit of a revamp. The Demolisher is still a big dude that just charges things like a rhino, he can still throw objects at you, he's still very resilient to damage, and overall, very, very deadly. And it looks like you can actually encounter them laying dormant in dark zones and kind of stealthily sneak by them as well, which is something I never thought I would do. They're always so alert and so aggressive, I never thought I'd be able to just sneak by a Demolisher but that is something that's new. Bolters are back in the same way that they appeared in the first game. They are non-hostile, they will never attack the player, they only come out at night time. When they see you, they will run away and they're very, very quick, and they may even attract other types of zombies. So I see these guys as less of an enemy and more of a challenge. Because if you do chase them down, and you do beat them to pieces, and you do loot them, you're going to get some pretty valuable stuff. Goons are back and as scary as ever with a whole new look. These are the big, slow, tanky zombies with a similar moveset to the first game. Their main attack is a ground pound with the heavy rebar that they're holding. It's got a big area of effect proximity, deals big, big damage, and you want to avoid that. Now, if you get too close, he might try to do a quick little swipe at you. And if you try to get behind him, it looks like he's got this cool little spin move that almost does a full 360 degree rotation. Now in the first game, when you did manage to take them down by bobbing and weaving and just being patient, they would drop their heavy rebar weapon, which had very limited durability, you couldn't repair it, and when you would swing it, it took down like all of your stamina, but it provided pretty big damage for an early low level weapon. In Dying Light 2, it's a little unclear whether or not we're going to be able to pick up that weapon, uh, because it is like fused into the Demolisher's arm now. But in the gameplay that TechLand released themselves, when the goon was killed, the rebar did detach from the arm and then completely despawn. So it is loaded in as a separate object, so potentially we might be able to pick it up. As mentioned earlier, bombers have returned, but we've only seen this one clip of them. Nothing else has been released, so it's a bit hard to judge, but it seems as though, so far, they act just like the bombers in the first game. You're going to want to deal with these guys at a long distance with a ranged weapon, because if you get too close, they're just going to blow up everything around them. We've also seen footage of a spitter zombie type that hasn't been officially named by Techland yet. It seems to be a descendant or an evolution of the toad from the first game. So, you know, pretty standard, good type to have in there, just hits you with those ranged attacks. Isn't too strong when you get up close and personal, but they can be a bit of a pain in the butt from a distance. Speaking of evolutions, there is the Howler, which seems to be a new and improved version of the Screamer from the first game. Like all special infected, a Howler developed from a viral whose transformation into a volatile was derailed by a sudden dose of chemicals. As these chemicals attacked the victim's larynx and lungs, Howlers were created. It's because of them that the streets of the city are so dangerous. They won't attack outright, but if one of them spots a human, the toxic substance in their chest will begin to boil 
soil, forcing them to emit an unearthly scream that will call other monsters from the surrounding area. A pulsating yellow growth on the Howler's torso will let you tell it apart from a viral. Instead of engaging, Howlers emit a high-pitched cry that will attract nearby infected and, in some cases, even stun regular people. So these guys are going to be extremely problematic, even though they don't attack you directly. They are what's going to set off those pursuits I was talking about earlier with four different levels in the nighttime. These are going to attract the Banshees, these are going to attract the Virals, and eventually the Volatiles as well. That's all going to kick off because one of these guys is like a little alarm system and noticed you. And if you're thinking about getting up close and personal to shut them up, well, think again because their screams will stun you. So so you're going to want to take care of these guys from a distance, and it has been confirmed by some of the folks who have played the game early that you can take them out silently and stealthily before they even have the chance to alert nearby zombies. In fact, I think you can actually sneak up behind them and hit them with a melee attack, but if they've noticed you, you want to keep your distance. One of the types of special infected that the Howler may attract with their scream, or that you may just run into in the nighttime in general, is the Banshee. A vivid symbol of punishment for the sins of vanity and unbridled consumerism. Pieces of her evening dress still cling to the Banshee's petite body, as does some gold jewellery. Her hands have transformed into claws, her manicured nails into talons. Although Banshee is driven by instincts, her behaviour seems to indicate some unsettling remnants of humanity. Could there be a woman trapped within the rotting flesh of this witch, tormented by brief flashes of lucidity? Being exceptionally deft, Banshees can jump really high to reach their prey. Due to their lower strength, they usually retreat if their deadly mid-air attack misses. We got a closer look at the Banshee during the CGI trailer, which was awesome in and of itself, and Techland have also released a comic book for the entire backstory on the Banshee and how she came to be. I'll leave a link to that in case you're interested. I'm personally more interested in the gameplay. These guys have such a cool fighting style. As mentioned, they launch at you. They can jump so damn far, and they'll swipe you, scratch your back when you're running away in a pursuit. You can see them jumping on top of other zombies as leverage to launch themselves towards you. And as described, if they do miss that attack, if you manage to dodge or escape it, they will retreat and then continue following you in the shadows until they're ready to make their next attack. It's just so cool. Like, we've never seen a zombie interact with other zombies so much in this way. I mean, sure, a goon or a demolisher can accidentally knock over other zombies, but the way that it jumps from zombie to zombie and jumps off other, like, objects and the terrain, the animations are so cool that... Anyway, I'm getting carried away. The, the important thing is, when you're encountering that banshee, I mean, always watch your back, because if you think you're being followed, you probably are. They are significantly faster than any other zombie type. The way that they leap, they can catch up to you when you're out sprinting volatiles and virals even. So always watch your back. Try to dodge their move and bait them and then smack the shit out of them. You're probably going to have a hard time dealing with them at a ranged distance because they move so quickly and erratically. Overall, such a cool enemy, going to be really exciting to encounter them in Dying Light 2, and in my opinion, they have the best design of any zombie in Dying Light 2. Except for the Revenant. Resembling a character from the worst nightmares, Revenant's easy to tell from other infected. He's unwieldy, slow, and moves hesitantly as his thin legs can't really support his bulk. His attempts to maintain balance are made all the more difficult by the growth on his back, which looks like petrified wings. These special mutations can buff surrounding monsters by creating a zone of toxic mist. This guy has a crazy range of movesets. He starts off from a distance throwing projectiles at you, pretty straightforward as he sort of bobs and weaves and dodges from side to side, making it harder for you to hit him. Occasionally, he's going to leap around the arena in which you encounter him, and there might be like a little proximity ground pound effect when he lands. Uh, it does seem to leave him vulnerable just for a moment when he does land as he stands back up and recovers from the jump, so that's a good opportunity to swing at his back a little bit. He's got a melee swipe, he's got a charge attack, he's got a shockwave like poison blast with a cone effect in front of him. 
He can create a zone of toxic mist which drains the player's health over time, and as mentioned earlier, he can also buff nearby zombies. But not only can he buff them, he can create them. He can just raise zombies and spawn them out of the ground, so now you're not just dealing with the Revenant, you're actually dealing with more enemies at once. So if you think he got lucky by spotting a Revenant on its own, think again. And although I haven't seen footage of it, Techlan has noted that they can paralyze humans, so... Shit, watch out for that, I guess. You want to keep your distance with this guy. You want to dodge his projectiles. You want to bait him into doing that leap, that ground pound, and smack him while he's recovering. Hit him from a distance, throw some spears if you can find them, or shoot some arrows. But <laughs> Slimesicle just beat the fuck out of this guy with a baseball bat and literally broke its legs. Like, you know how I mentioned just before that his thin legs can't support the weight of those petrified wings? You can cripple the Revenant. I don't know if it's just a dying animation, it's a very short clip from Slimesicle's YouTube video, but at the very least, you can break their legs. It just makes you wonder what other little details we haven't seen yet, whether it be the Revenant or other zombies, and just dealing specific types of damage to them. These little details are just so, so appreciated when they come up. Now there is one more type of special infected that we've yet to cover in this video. It's a monster that we don't even fully know what it looks like, because all we've seen is this little 7 second snippet from an E3 2019 trailer. I'm talking about the Drowner. The Drowner is like the most mysterious type of infected. Techland have very much kept this guy under wraps, and I don't want you to keep in mind that the information I'm about to give you about this enemy all comes from 2019. It comes from interviews, footage, Q&A stuff. Techland just hasn't talked about this enemy type in years. They've been revealing details about the other zombies, their backstories, little combat things, but they haven't talked about the Drowner since that time of E3 2019, so once again, just a disclaimer, this information could be out of date, but here's what we learned about the Drowner back then. As the name suggests, these guys hang out in areas with large bodies of water, and they jump out of the water to launch surprise attacks on the player. The Drowner is only unlocked if you make certain main story decisions, and it's possible to go the entire game without unlocking them at all. From the little teaser where we did get a sneak peek at the Drowner, it looks like the decision to turn the water pumps on and completely redesign the district is what brought the Drowners into the game. Now, the name Drowner does bring some other enemy types from other games to mind, like the Drowners from the Witcher series, or even the Drowners in Dead Island Riptide, created by Techland and the predecessor to Dying Light. In Dead Island Riptide, there were corpses floating atop the water everywhere in the game. Now, some of these were actual corpses, but a lot of them were an enemy type known as Drowners, who were pretty much infected, or virals, as we're using Dying Light terms, that can move quickly in water. Neither the Drowners nor any other enemy could actually swim in the Dead Island games, which was fine because the player also couldn't swim. But a little known fact about Dying Light 1 is that the player also wasn't even supposed to swim in that game because they didn't have time to implement it. But one stubborn programmer came in on the weekend and created the swimming mechanic that ended up playing a fairly big role in the game. However, the swimming mechanic in Dying Light 1 did essentially turn any large body of water into a safe zone where only toads and volatiles could sometimes hit you with their ranged attacks. And this begs the question, can the Drowner swim in Dying Light 2? Because that would be pretty terrifying if they can, and that means that water is no longer a safe zone. But anyway, that is everything we know so far about the infected that we're going to be facing in Dying Light 2. I hope this has made you feel a bit more prepared for the game, and hopefully more excited as well, without spoiling too much. Let me know if you have any questions about the infected in the comments below, or if you've noticed something that I haven't. And, uh, well... I'll see you out there in the world of Dying Light 2. Cheers, guys.